This webinar is co-presented by the International Hospital Federation and the Africa Healthcare Federation in collaboration with the World Telehealth Initiative. Before we begin, some housekeeping reminders. First, to avoid any noise interference, all attendees will be on mute throughout the webinar. Please also submit your questions using the Q&A function. Our speakers will try their best, where time permits, to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A segment. And lastly, this forum is being recorded and the link to the webinar recording will be emailed to you in a few days. And now to begin the webinar, it is my pleasure to invite Sharon Allen, who is the co-founder and executive director of the World Telehealth Initiative for her welcome and introduction. Sharon, please. Thank you, Rachel. I am so happy to be here today to explore the power of telehealth. Did you know that half of our planet lacks the vital access to medical expertise that they need? And that is what compelled World Telehealth Initiative or WTI to respond. Technology enables a sustainable solution to an increasingly complex problem. Five years ago, WTI developed an innovative model that connects remote volunteer physicians from anywhere in the world to deliver medical expertise to providers and health systems in resource constrained settings. This is all made possible by using telehealth technology. Today, World Telehealth Initiative has 25 active programs in 13 countries and many more in development. For each program we establish, we have three primary goals in mind. The first is to advance the healthcare skills and capacity of the local physicians and care teams. Secondly, we want to improve health outcomes for the people in under-resourced communities. And the last goal is to increase opportunities for compassionate, skilled healthcare professionals to make a difference for those in need. Today, you will hear from three passionate physicians that have partnered with WTI to create programs that serve the needs of their unique communities. Our partners are the primary drivers of all initiatives. They design the program based upon their health system needs and their resources and their capacity. And then we partner with them to implement and sustain that program. These are three incredible individuals, each with a noteworthy story and perspective around the value of implementing telehealth at their clinic or hospital site. They're the backbone to each of these programs and the success they've achieved in their community is because of their dedication and support. I trust you'll learn something different and compelling from each speaker. I'm excited for this engaging discussion, so thank you for joining us today. Before we welcome the speakers, however, I'd like to first introduce you to Ronald Lavater, Chief Executive Officer of the International Hospital Federation. Ron, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sharon, and welcome, everyone. My name is Ron Lavater. I'm the CEO of the International Hospital Federation, and we are super excited to partner with WTI and the African Health Care Federation to bring you this webinar. The IHF has been around for more than 90 years. We're based here in Geneva, and we have over 125 organizations across the globe that are part of our membership. And last year, I had an opportunity to build a relationship and a partnership with Ahmed Thacker, who you'll meet in a minute. The Africa Healthcare Federation and the IHF have come together to expand knowledge sharing events like this and other activities between our two organizations. We believe that this relationship is gonna be very fruitful as the IHF can open a window to other activities across the globe from our members. We span all the continents and over 50 countries. 
So I'm super proud and pleased to be part of this today. You're gonna to enjoy this uh, event. And let me turn it over to my friend, Ahmed, please go ahead. Let me first say that working with IHF since our signed agreement has been tremendously useful for us to promote this partnership across Africa. At this session, I see lots of people who logged in from Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, and many other countries in Africa. It's a testament that this partnership is going to bring healthcare closer to the people. Africa Healthcare Federation is a journey that began almost 18 years ago, where in Kenya, private sector firms came together and created a country federation of non-state actor organizations known as Kenya Healthcare Federation. Thereafter, many countries around the region came and followed the same model and East Africa Healthcare Federation was created in 2012, four years later. And by 2016, many countries around Africa felt that a unified federation of non-state could change policy and could promote affordable quality and equitable healthcare. Africa Healthcare Federation was officially formed in 2018 and the board took its uh, function on 2019. I'm the president of Africa Healthcare Federation and we have 10 directors from around the region and we look forward to creating partnerships within and Africa and with all institutions like IHF that bring real solutions and tangible uh, solutions to deal with the challenges we have. And this particular webinar, when it's gonna talk about the whole digital health solution is really, really close to the health systems in Africa. The pandemic has revealed that if there's one major change to bridge the geographical barrier for health, it's going to be telemedicine. We realize that many patients stayed away from hospitals and clinics, but still needed the medication and the chronic treatment. We realized that some people were scared when the rates of the COVID-19 infections were very high to go to the hospitals. And telemedicine has been really talked about, but today, I'm hoping to learn a lot more on how it can be scaled up more effectively, especially at the primary healthcare level. So Ron, having this partnership is amazing. And uh, we look forward to creating a stronger network of AHF and IHF ecosystem, both around the world and in Africa. Thank you for giving me this chance and uh, look forward. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you. Now, without further delay, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Iftikhar Mahmood. He is the founder and president of Hope Foundation for Women and Children in Bangladesh. Dr. Mahmood. Uh, good morning from Miami, Florida. I'm joining you uh, from uh, Florida. I, um, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks to the organizers of this uh, webinar, uh, World Telehealth Initiative and uh, International Hospital Federation and Africa Healthcare Federation. I will present our work uh, in Bangladesh uh, through our organization, Hope Foundation for Women and Children of Bangladesh. Um, I'll do a slight presentation. So as Sharon mentioned, I'm the founder of Hope Foundation also an adjunct professor, College of Public Health, University of Nebraska. I'm a practicing physician in Miami, a pediatrician, a board certified for about 25 years. I'll just briefly talk about our foundation, uh, which I established in 1999 in USA, uh, with an aim to provide affordable health care to the needy people in the rural areas of Bangladesh. We have many programs, but the major ones are Safe Motherhood Program, which is to provide end-to-end -end, uh, care to pregnant women in the area. Also, we serve the Rohingya refugees. If you probably know, there is a huge influx of Rohingya refugees in 2017, about 1.2 million people living in that area. So we have a large presence uh, in that camps. 
We also provide COVID response program, obstetric fistula program. We have a midwife institute. Also, we have telemedicine, which I will talk about today. Uh, we work out of about 68 facilities. We have two uh, full uh, running hospitals. This is one of our hospitals uh, in Cox's Bazaar district of Bangladesh in southern part. And this is the Rohingya camps. Probably you have seen pictures of this few years ago that uh, in that uh, the Rohingya people came from Myanmar, uh, about 1.2 million people. This is our field hospital waiting area. In this hospital, we provide full range of maternity care as well as outpatient for general uh, health care uh, for that population. Uh, this is a picture of our midwifery school here. And uh, in past uh, five years, five past six years, our uh, patient uh, services numbers have gone up uh, really tremendously, especially since we got involved in the refugee cares, but our organization also expanded. Last year, we have uh, had about 500,000 patient contacts. So the def I would start by def defining the telemedicine uh, through World Health Organization's definition, which is the delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor. By all healthcare professionals using information and communication technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases and injuries, research and evaluation, and for the continuing education of the healthcare providers, all in the interest of advancing health of individuals and the communities. So there are, I see that there are four important elements here. One is the critical uh, factor is distance. And this uh, the, the, the should be used uh, for telemedicine, should be used for diagnosis, treatment and prevention, research evaluation and training the healthcare providers that will benefit the individual and the community. So ultimately that the, the individual and the community must be benefited through this telemedicine uh, function. There are four types of telemedicine uh, uh, primarily. Uh, one is live video conferencing, asynchronous video, remote patient monitoring, mobile health, uh, like M health. So the live conferencing, all we, we all know about it. Asynchronous is basically uh, taking videos and, and, and using the videos uh, for diagnosis and treatment. A remote patient care, patient monitoring is basically exchange of electronic healthcare and mobile health is using smartphones, tablets, uh, used through video chats and other electronic um, health exchanges. Uh, the history, actually, I have looked at the literature and I, I found that it uh, started like the, the first telemedicine concept was uh, mentioned in Lancet in 1879 as using the telephone to deduce unnecessary office visit. And I'm happy to say that uh, first uh, video conferencing started at University of Nebraska uh, in 1959, which is uh, an, a university that I have recently been affiliated with as a professor. And I'm very happy about that. And we all know that in in last three years since the COVID um, uh, hit the world, uh, the pandemic, uh, that uh, that really it uh, changed the landscape of telemedicine. Actually, everywhere, all over the world, we use telemedicine. Uh, globally, I have looked at some of the data like uh, during COVID and pre-COVID, and that actually shows uh, what we know, that uh, there is a tremendous increase of use of telemedicine uh, in Europe, in, in India, in, in the North America, and all parts of the world. I, where I practice in Miami, uh, we uh, closed our practice for four months from in the in 2020 from March to July. All we did was telemedicine, uh, 100%. And and still now till today we use at least 30% of our care provide we provide through telemedicine. Uh, the in the U.S. the telemedicine market has grown uh, tremendously in in pre-COVID time in 2018. The market was about 10 billion. Currently, it stands uh, 20, almost 20 billion, and it is expected to grow 35 billion by 2025 in the US market. And uh, if you look at the distribution, you'll see that the telemedicine is, uh, is basically leading 
is in North America, US and Canada, uh, then Europe, and then Asia Pacific, and then Latin American Caribbean countries, and very small uh, percentage is in Middle East and Africa. Whereas if you look at the population, uh, uh, Africa uh, is the second uh, in, in the number of people, 1.6 billion, uh, uh, first being the uh, Asia Pacific, uh, 3.4 billion, and then uh, uh, then the, the Europe is 750 billion, 50 million people, and Latin America is about 600 million, and the lowest is actually North America, 400 million. They're using the most of telemedicine services. Mm, uh, this is a this is a data from 2016. Um, I believe that it is still pretty same. Uh, so we can see that here our friends from Africa. Healthcare Federation is uh, present, will, is uh, the organizer, one of the organizers, and we'll have we'll hear from our uh, colleagues from Africa, and it is very very relevant that we need to invest uh, in in telemedicine in that area definitely. Uh, in Bangladesh, in my country where I am from, um, actually we started uh, using telemedicine in 1999, the first time. Uh, there is an institution called Center for uh, paralyzed, which is CRP, uh, a, a British uh, charitable trust uh, used uh, telemedicine to connect CRP with the Royal Navy Hospital in the UK. Uh, in 2000, uh, the, the, the telecom giant of Bangladesh, Grameen Telecom, started using uh, tele, telephone services providing healthcare for the rural areas. And they also started the health line uh, to give low cost. Uh, consultation, and they had about 10 million subscribers. Uh, currently in Bangladesh still is lagging uh, that uh, behind in the telemedicine care, and it is not actually organized in Bangladesh yet. But however, there are about 50 digital platform being used right now in Bangladesh, a country of 170 million people. Here uh, at Hope Foundation, we started our telemedicine in 2018. Uh, we have two devices that we got from uh, telehealth, uh, World Telehealth Initiative um, and, and uh, collaboration with Direct Live. In the picture, I'm in the middle and, uh, I'm, and uh, with uh, Dr. Yulan Wang and his wife, Susan, uh, in Cox's Bazaar uh, in our Hope Hospital uh, in 2019. And that device actually invented uh, uh, by Dr. Yulan Wang and he's, he's the founder of World Telehealth Initiative and we are very proud, proud partner of them. And in our um, hospital, as I said, there are two devices um, and we are using them for vulnerable uh, communities like the Rohingya refugees. We have we use one device and we also use another device uh, in our uh, Hope Hospital to provide service to the local poor community. In, in, in our area, like um, at, there are, there are Quite a bit of shortage of health providers. So this telemedicine, especially, uh, is very helpful for giving specialty care. Um, for example, we are using right now internal medicine, dermatology, neurology, pulmonary medicine, pediatric surgery, and and psychiatry. Uh, our main uh, specialties that we are using telemedicine for. Uh, in in our district of uh, three over three million people, there is one only one psychiatrist. Uh, that uh, uh, in that area, there is no neurologist that I know of, full-time neurologist. There is no pulmonary medicine doctor there. So, so you know, there is a severe shortage of these kind of services, which our devices and the, the, our partnership with Well Telehealth Initiative actually addressing that gap. We are using these devices to provide service to the very poor, very remote area, very vulnerable people. Um, and I just want to share a story about a, a, a one story. We have we have hundreds. So this uh, 63 year old uh, the lady who is a Rohingya refugee who came to our clinic uh, with abdominal pain and some respiratory distress. Our provider did physical examination and and took some history. Uh, she she connected to Dr. Susanna Daniel as an international pulmonologist from the USA through tele World Telehealth Initiative. And she was diagnosed properly with uh, peptic ulcer disease and bronchial asthma. She was treated and she, she became well. 
And, and there are hundreds of patients like that we have, we have been treating uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, we also use in our uh, hospital uh, network, we also use balcony apps, which is we are piloting across our network for emergency patient referral. It's, it's like sort of like Uber, but it's a medical using for medical purposes. We also use maternity foundation uh, partnership. Uh, we, we use apps for teaching our midwives. We also, during the pandemic, we used many virtual consult consultation through smartphones and, and just telephone um, services um, um, in, in our hospitals and networks. So the future of uh, telemedicine in Bangladesh uh, looking better um, that the government is interested uh, to uh, increase the telemedicine services uh, that and investors are very also very much interested to invest in telemedicine services. At this point, our uh, there is a gap between the physician and patient ratio uh, in our country that uh, about four physicians for 10,000. World Health Organization recommends about 10 for 10,000 uh, people. And, and the U.S. where I practice, it is about 30 per 10,000. So there is a tremendous need. And I hope that uh, the, through collaboration with the public and private partnership, our country will have more and more telemedicine so we can address the health needs of that country. Right now, there are about 30 organizations has been registered with the Information Communication Technology Division of the ministry. And, and uh, there is, there is um, work in progress to draft a framework uh, for the telemedicine. We have all seen the benefits of telemedicine through the pandemic time. Um, at Hope Foundation, uh, we, as, we, as I said, we started in 99. Right now we are using, uh, we are running about 68 health centers, but we are growing very fast. So we, we hope to expand our healthcare uh, um, the, across different districts of the country. And we want to uh, uh, take telemedicine with us and, and to, um, to expand, uh, to, to grow our work and use the technology to benefit the patient and, and address the gaps. Uh, at HOPE, we aim to integrate telemedicine in our entire network space in coming years. And, and of course, that will require uh, substantial investment. And I just wanted to share some images of patient, and this definitely speaks uh, volume. As you can see, this uh, Rohingya patient, there are some providers from our side. And also, I want to emphasize that by providing this telemedicine, not only the patients are getting benefit, but our providers are learning. This is also a training. We are using these devices for training our doctors who are learning from the very experts uh, from all over the world. So that is an, a benefit that we, we sometimes overlook, but we should not. Uh, so there are some other images here, as you can see, that um, we are um, uh, using the telemedicine. And most of our doctors from the US, but I think we have few doctors from UK um, as well. A derma this is a dermatologist, a very good friend of mine from Florida has been uh, providing service telemedicine services for about seven years now. Initially, he used to use Skype and WhatsApp. Now he's using, using the tele, World Telehealth uh, Initiative device um, that, um, that we have the, uh, been donated to. Uh, and I just want to finish with uh, like uh, thoughts that are or a fact. So we are looking to uh, achieve the sustainable development goal, probably you all know. And one of the goal is to have universal healthcare, which is to provide, to reach every people in the world, which is 7 billion people uh, the, to, to, and, and, and give them healthcare. So at this point, we all know that that is not possible without uh, telemedicine. We need this technology. If we want to uh, be true to our words and deeds and with that, that, that we want to achieve the sustainable goal, the only means that I can think that will help is the telemedicine. Otherwise, it will not be possible. I want to thank the audience for uh, being with me and listening to me. And I want to thank the organizers again uh, for the opportunity that's been given to me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, before you uh, go off screen, I just have one question for you because you were actually one of the very early adopters of telehealth, certainly in Bangladesh and with WTI as one of our partners. 
Real quickly, what would you identify as the single largest benefit of telehealth? So in, in, in our case, in our case, through our three years of experience, uh, that I would say that uh, tele, the, this telemedicine brings the expertise that will not, is not otherwise uh, absolutely possible uh, to area that we work. And this area is representative of many areas in Bangladesh that where we don't have a, a single pulmonary doctor or say single neurologist. And people are having strokes. People are having uh, the, the, the neurological diseases. They will not get any treatment, but with this tele device, we are able to, we are able to provide those cares to them. As I, as I showed one patient with a pulmonary doctor, we don't have a single pulmonary, pulmonary in the district of over 3 million people only have one psychiatrist. So we use, this is the best benefit that I can, I can say that also being the, you know, the training the our providers. So they're, they're learning and they are now, is, you know, we can shift the task from a pulmonologist to a, a GP and do the, do the job uh, the, the better than uh, otherwise they would not be do, able to do. Thank you, Dr. Mahmood. I noticed that you weren't able to do a single benefit, but you gave us a couple of benefits. So thank you very much. And we'll be um, reuniting with you in the Q&A. Thank you. At this time, I'm delighted to welcome our second speaker of the day, Dr. Nosa Ekpede, a consultant public health physician who is the executive director of Precious Gems in Nigeria. I'm Dr. Nusa Akbede, the director of Precious Gems Nigeria. I work in Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital, Irua Edo State. And I'm here to talk about the benefits of telehealth in, in, my, uh, in our, my community and in my state. Well, I'm starting with the Nigerian Healthcare Delivery System. Nigeria has a population of almost 200 million people with the majority living in remote rural areas with little or no access to modern health facilities. Poverty, geographical isolation, lack of trained personnel, difficulties in traveling to urban cities such as Lagos, Abuja, poorly equipped facilities. These all results in limited access to medical services in rural impoverished areas in Nigeria. However, a healthcare delivery system that could allow physicians to manage patients in remote locations would improve accessibility and quality of healthcare in isolated and impoverished areas. Precious Gems in 2021 carried out series of medical activities and outreaches in Edo Central Local Government, Edo State, Nigeria. And in a particular health facility in Opoji, it was discovered that the inhabitants had, majority of the inhabitants had high blood pressure. I raised this issue with Dr. Obo Akioyame, who is the founder of Precious Gems, and Dr. Yunet Thomas, the founder of Urban Health 360 US, which led to the collaboration with Sharon Allen of World Telehealth Initiative US. We had several meetings that spanned months, several months. And the fruits of those meetings, hard work, dedication, commitment is the installment of the Teladoc Vetra program in Opoji Comprehensive Health Center. Opoji Comprehensive Health Center is a primary healthcare facility built by a prominent member of that community and managed by the Department of Public Health, Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital, Edo State. We have 13 resident doctors, eight public health nurses, and 10 community health workers on weekly rotation drafted from public health department of Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital. Okay. This is a snapshot of Opoji Comprehensive Health Center. 
As you can see here, it's a simple building, not complicated in a rural settlement. Now, what are our expected benefits from this Teladoc virtual program installed in Opoji? Provision of curative, preventing and rehabilitative health services, as we are beginning to see and experience, building capacity of local health team and reduction of brain drain, as in migration of doctors. And this helps retain health workers in much needed areas. Provision of health facilities for the underprivileged and underserved, whose burden of disease is oftentimes considerably higher than their ability to assess health care. Reduction of the need to refer complicated cases to faraway places, like I mentioned before, big cities like Abuja, Lagos, Potakot, is where you have big hospitals. Such referrals impose significant travel and financial burden on families and communities and often result in unnecessary mortality. The treatment and learning program facilitates, enhances, and sustains training and development of the healthcare practice community in Edo states. Other benefits are implementation and use of the devices for treatment, teaching and capacity building, ongoing training, professional development, and knowledge building of physicians, medical students, nurses, nursing students, and all allied healthcare professionals in Edo State. The Teladoc devices arrived in Opoji Kingdom on August 7, 2021, 9 a.m. in the morning in unbossed crates. They were received by myself on behalf of Precious Gems, Urban Health 360, and World Telehealth Initiative. Now, this is a snapshot showing the arrival of the Telagdog device. Yeah, trying to drive in, it's driving in, the truck is driving in into the Opoji facility. You can see that the crates are covered. Here, you see Dr. Emwa. Dr. Emwa is our IT specialist, he's a medical doctor and is very proficient in uh, technology. He is installing the Teladoc device in Opoji Comprehensive Health Center, as you can see here. We had a formal launch of the virtual program in Opoji Comprehensive Health Center on October 5th, 2021. Here, we had a gathering of stakeholders from the community stakeholders and medical specialists from Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital and primary healthcare centers across Edo Central Local Government Area. The hall was packed full and it was a very interesting event. Here we have a stakeholder of Opoji community giving a speech on the benefits of Teladoc virtual program. And in the same event, this is myself, Dr. Nusa, but they're giving a vote of thanks. Here, this is a, an ongoing training session with Jessica of World Telehealth Initiative. Jessica is a hardworking, committed, dedicated World Telehealth Initiative staff. I'm so pleased to know her. She, in this, she's putting us through here on the use of Teladoc device. This is myself and Dr. Emma on a session with Jessica. Now this picture shows the commencement of online consultations with doctors from Providence Hospital, collaborating with on-site physicians, I mean, uh, resident doctors um, um, drafted from Ira Specialist Teaching Hospital. So we have international doctors from US specializing in um, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, um, pediatrics, or, uh, ops and gynae. And I know that 
others will also join into in the nearest future. So this is a very, we had a very interesting experience here. So Dr. Connie Bartlett is online, co-managing um, co these patients with our resident doctor in Opoji Comprehensive Health Center. And here we are having a session with a patient with a, a doctor online from US, and this is a family health physician presenting the case to the doctor via the teladoc device. This snapshot is showing Dr. Otaibe. Dr. Otaibe is a very dedicated and hardworking senior resident and presently the chief resident of the Department of Public Health, Ira Specialist Teaching Hospital. He is presenting a patient with high blood pressure to Dr. Beckley online. We have, we've had several, we've had feedbacks on several patients, but time cannot permit for me to, as in, uh, I, this, I can only focus on one of them. And so these are the exact words spoken by Mr. Vincent Isemogwa, a stakeholder at Opoji, who is currently being managed by on-site doctors and physicians from Providence. In his own words, the program is a welcome development that somebody in Nissan Central can discuss with doctors in the US has never happened before. This has opened our eyes for medical checkup. Our people have been going overseas for consultations, which is now happening in Opoji. We appreciate you and are expecting more expansion to the machine. As experienced by our own daughter, Osan, Dr. Osan Otaibe, in his own words, he says, I have had enriching discussions which has helped improve my clinical knowledge so far. Exchange of ideas has helped patient management. Patients express joy at seeing the collaboration with international experts. Patients feel happy at the opportunity to interact with different specialists. In Dr. Omorobe Isaac Newton's own words, he's narrating his experience. Dr. Omorobe Isaac Newton is a senior registrar in Atopoji and from the Department of Public Health. He says, the importance of telemedicine as a new concept in Africa's healthcare cannot be overemphasized. My first unforgettable experience about telemedicine was three weeks ago when I was on duty at Opoji Health Center. A three-year-old male child was brought to the facility with complaints of inability to hold his neck, crawl, stand, talk, or eat by himself since birth. Diagnosis of cerebral palsy was made following detailed clerking and clinical examination. I was fortunate to have a session with a specialist pediatrician, Dr. Connie Bartlett. She discussed the medical condition with me and the mother. Every uncertainty was laid to rest. This is one of the medical experiences that require consultant input. Now, what are our challenges and concerns? as regards the Teladoc virtual program installed in Opoji. Currently, network connectivity is very poor, poor in rural areas in Nigeria. And this is a major problem, but we are trying to overcome it. And we're doing our best so far. Patients want to be examined with the device. So we may need some attachments. Um, uh, we are very happy with the stethoscope that has been brought in uh, from a um, World Telehealth Initiative, and we want more attachments. Lack of laboratory equipment in Opoji Center and in other centers in uh, rural areas. Patients have to go far to carry out their recommended investigations because we don't have laboratory equipment in health facilities in rural areas. And this, this also impacts on the use of the machine. With more patients benefiting, the number may escalate to a point that could be overwhelming for staff. That is a concern that may arise anytime in the future. 
And in the event of a technical problem or a malfunction in the Teladoc robot machine, assessing timely correct technical expertise is a concern. Emergence of persons into leadership of collaborating institutions like we have here, we know fully well that this, this um, wonderful project is as a result of the collaboration between precious gems, Urban Health 360 and World Telehealth Initiative. I think this is a new, is a new approach, what is, uh, is giving us results. And we are just hoping, we just like we are expressing, people are expressing fears that if persons come into leadership of these collaborator, collaborations, collaborating institutions and do not have the same vision, it might stall the progress of this project. In conclusion, telehealth as a means of delivering healthcare in rural communities in Nigeria can make quality healthcare accessible to patients in rural impoverished communities. What we need is dedication, hard work, commitment, focus, and continuous technological input. Technology is wonderful, isn't it? And improvement to the process. The success of World Telehealth Initiative virtual program as a result of the collaboration with Precious Gents, Urban Health 360, and World Telehealth Initiative at Opoji Comprehensive Health Center is a testimony to the above mentioned facts. I want to use this means to acknowledge and thank World Telehealth Initiative, Sharon Allen, you are wonderful. In fact, we appreciate you. Thank you for all your hard work, your efforts, your commitment. Thank you so much, Dr. Nosa, for sharing your experiences. Now that your fledgling program is up and running, I'd just like to ask you, you know, with all the support you've received from the Providence healthcare providers, I think there's, you know, six or seven different specialties represented and maybe 20 providers beaming in on a regular basis. How would you like to see this program grow in the future? Well, I'm happy, first of all, I'm happy with the way it is now. We're just starting. So what we see is expected. And we, have, we are beginning to raise awareness about it. And the doctors are coming on. We are working on the connectivity. But how would I want to see it grow? I will want more patients uh, patronage. That will be on our side. That means we need to work hard, raise awareness in our communities. Then on the part of WTI and Providence Hospital, I want more doctors. Yes, one more doctors to participate in this virtual training program. We are learning from you. Our patients are happy. You can see the joy. Some of the pictures are deleted. You can see the joy in the patient's faces. You can see when our, our residents are interacting with experts from abroad, you can, they, 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 they are joyful. It's like that experience. You cannot buy it anywhere. It's a new experience. And it, it actually it makes us feel high. We are happy, we are excited. So we want more, more doctors to participate. Let's we want to learn from them. We don't want to start traveling to get this experience. We want to learn it on our homestead. Yes, and interact, collaborate with people from all over the world. It's a wonderful experience. We want it to continue and to grow. And then we want it replicated. Yes, repl replicated in underserved, impoverished, rural communities across not only Nigeria, across Africa. We need this in Africa because of the death of medical doctors. Right now, because of the low social economic conditions, our specialists are leaving. They are migrating to Western countries. And then we have no one to train our growing doctors and we don't have specialists to attend to our patients. We need this collaboration for our patients benefit improvement of healthcare, in the state and the country, an improvement and a provision of quality healthcare across Africa. 
Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Nosa. Last but not least, I would like to welcome our final speaker, Dr. Mahari Gabriel-Hans, Associate Professor from the Department of Neurology at UT Southwestern. Dr. Mahari. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks for uh, the uh, introduction and uh, thanks for giving me the uh, opportunity uh, to speak on this uh, uh, webinar uh, along uh, with uh, these uh, uh, wonderful uh, professionals. Uh, as uh, Sharon um, indicated, I'm at the University of Texas uh, Southwestern in Dallas, uh, Texas. And um, my, uh, my specialty uh, and my concentration is as a, a neurologist uh, is in a stroke in uh, global health and uh, telemedicine and telehealth. So uh, I think um, I have uh, found, you know, my calling in a very uh, nice uh, combination of these three, uh, neurology, stroke, global health, and uh, uh, telemedicine, because they're very, very uh, interrelated. Uh, uh, because um, neurology, neurolo neurological diseases are uh, one of the top, uh, you know, uh, burdens of diseases uh, in the world among non-communicative diseases. And uh, when it comes to also stroke, stroke has uh, a very uh, large burden, uh, especially uh, in in Africa. And then, and then, one way we're addressing this. Uh, gap uh, in disparity is through uh, telemedicine. And uh, my story uh, in telemedicine uh, goes uh, back uh, in the, to the uh, early yeah, days of development uh, when I was uh, a resident, neurology resident at the Medical College of uh, Georgia, where the telemedicine uh, equipment itself, you know, you know was being uh, developed uh, by you know uh, one of like medical students who was very very uh, technically gifted in a very crude way, uh, which uh, led actually to the uh, birth of uh, uh, one of the telemedicine systems, Reach. So Reach was born in at the Medical College of Georgia, then it went private, and then I think it was taken over by uh, Teledoc. So. Uh, so my passion goes back to <laughs> my training, uh, you know, as an as a neurologist. And uh, today uh, I want to share with you the the global how how global you know uh, outreach uh, actually helps to uh, to uh, bridge the gap in disparity, uh, you know, of care, and then uh, how uh, what you know what, what uh, telemedicine or telehealth uh, uh, contribution to that uh, may be. So, so the first uh, uh, slide that uh, we're uh, seeing here is actually from the uh, annual review of uh, uh, public health as a meta-analysis uh, on uh, telemedicine use, especially in the United States, but it's a really uh, a window uh, to how uh, how telemedicine's uh, role has growing, and also what a what what the benefits are. And uh, uh, this is you know the first one is like telemedicine guided treatment. It showed like you know uh, is like you know as uh, effect as safe and effective as care provided at traditional stroke uh, centers. This is based on the three uh, hour window of giving a uh, stroke treatment. And then the other one is actually, it's an analysis of 1.5 million uh, Texans uh, via telestroke. And it showed that, you know, the telemedicine expanded access to uh, acute stroke care, you know, without evidence of racial, ethnic or disparity. In other ways, in other myths, like, you know, it was, widely available and effective, no matter where people lived, what their racial makeup was, stuff, 
So in that way, it showed not only treating them, but you know, making it available to you know, everyone, uh, you know, regardless of their racial ethnicity or where they live, whether like rural or um, in the cities. And then uh, the other one was done, uh, you know, this is like a review of about you know, 1600 uh, cases in the Northeast, uh, looking at like uh, uh, stroke consultations through telemedicine. And it showed in, under, uh, in uh, underserved communities, uh, it resulted in higher rates of stroke thrombolysis treatment compared with national averages. That means where there was no telemedicine and resulted in fewer patient transfers to primary stroke centers. That means like, you know, so it's saving the time that the medication is being given to the patients for stroke. You know, there is, uh, you know, the, the, the economy part is like transporting them and then the time that's lost. And then also the, what, what the hospitals, uh, you know, benefit economically by keeping their patients where they are, not losing their patients. And then the other uh, uh, part was what this uh, uh, analysis showed was it is cost effective, especially when accounting for the cumulative lifetime expense of medical care follow-up uh, that are influenced by timely intervention. You know, this is even though like at the at the at the front end, there is a lot of investment. It could be you know expensive, but once the system is in place you know, for the rest of the lifetime of that system and also for the patient, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the loss from disability, from lots of productivity and, and then hospital costs, all that, you know, when you compare that, it is highly, highly uh, cost uh, effective. So, so, I mean, who, 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 can, who can argue with this? you know, in, in order to, to, to encapsulate. It is safe, it is effective, it is equitable. It doesn't matter, you know, ethnicity, where you live, you know, distance wise, as long as with the, you know, whether you live in a rural or uh, city, or, you know, even within the city, you can, you can be like in a hospital where there is no, uh, maybe a stroke uh, center, you know, it is, you know, it, it, you know, it addresses uh, equity and definitely it is, you know, efficient. You don't need to transport patients from place to place. You can give it with the, with the uh, uh, you know, a loaded time and it is uh, uh, cost effective. By the way, this uh, study was, I'm, I'm uh, showing you just a stroke, but they looked at actually uh, other things too, like, you know, diabetes heart failure, stroke, pregnancy. And all, in all these areas, it has shown to be very, very useful. And especially within da in diabetes, actually, the use has like skyrocketed, you know, where people just like, you know, being able to monitor uh, people's blood sugar and, you know, you know, avoid having good blood glucose control and avoiding hospitalization. Same thing with heart failure. You know, just by looking at them, you know, making sure, you know, you know, they're not taking too much salt, they're, you know, they're not swelling, they're not taking too much water. They even have these days uh, implantable devices that would, you know, alert the doctor that the patient is going to go into bad heart failure. And, you know, things can be uh, addressed very early without, you know, uh, 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 expensive hospitalization. So when it comes to the higher burden uh, of a stroke uh, in Africa, uh, there are a number of things. And uh, in my, you know, academic life, uh, I, you know, I wear like, you know, well, many hats and, you know, like I said, addressing the stroke part, the global health and the uh, telemedicine. And uh, I, you know, I have to, I, I had to design a system uh, or an initiative, uh, which was like a global outreach. And this global outreach, I would believe, uh, gives like, you know, an enduring solution uh, 
that empowers the community through capacity building. So this is not this is not you know tourism where you know people go and do things uh, from one corner of the world to another and then feel good about themselves, uh, saying you know I was here today, I was here in South America next time. This is about commitment, and this is about you know uh, building uh, uh, you know something that that lasts and where you can transfer knowledge and capacity uh, for, for the community. So one, one, one problem is lack of you know, awareness of you know, you know, disease uh, like stroke. Uh, and then the other one is you know, poverty. The other one is you know, poor infrastructure. And then disparity uh, you know, within like rural and urban healthcare. And then brain drain, uh, that's been, uh, already mentioned, and then by the way, brain drain can happen uh, between Africa and the West, and even like in the country, even, even in Africa, between uh, 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 rural and city. You know, doctors from rural area, once they're trained, they don't go back uh, to their, uh, uh, you know, uh, area where they grew up. They rather all are concentrated in the city. So I came up uh, with this uh, uh, initiative. I call it uh, the Born Initiative, not the Born Identity, not 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 the movie. This is the Born Initiative, uh, the Bahardar Outreach for uh, Neuroscience Education. So Bahardar is in the northwestern part of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the second most populous country next to Nigeria, with 110 million people. And I was aware of uh, this place uh, in 2016 when they told me. Uh, there are like, you know, a couple of hospitals, regional hospitals, and they have a reach of 7 million, but no neurologist at that time, 2016. So, you know, so I just like said, okay, let's, let's try something. And I traveled there. So no thrombolytic therapy, no stroke units, inadequate rehabilitation services. And there was just like one, maybe two hospitals have uh, CT scan. And in order to have like an enduring uh, presence, what I would do, what I did was, I, you know, meant, you know, started an official institutional affiliation with the University of uh, Bahardar Health Center with our University of Texas Southwestern, uh, and then uh, actually recently transformed this global health into global health and disparities program. We may ask why. Because, you know, like people, when they say about, you know, global health, there is like a tinge of just like thinking of global means almost they equate it to means foreign. And they forget like, we're all living in the global world. You know, uh, it is, you know, it's all about disparities. Even all the things that we've been talking about today, uh, it is about, you know, addressing disparities. That's what we're trying to do with telemedicine to uh, fill the gap, the disparities, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, across the ocean to Africa, uh, whether it's like uh, to the rural Texas or to uh, southern border to Mexico, wherever there may be. So it is about disparities. And we want to have uh, uh, a faculty and resident who actually appreciate, you know, these disparities, especially since COVID and all, everything that we saw and, uh, you know, produce uh, uh, people who are like leaders in uh, addressing these issues and 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 also benefit the host, uh, uh, our host uh, or uh, sister uh, facility in Ethiopia, wherever it might be. So this, we have like you know virtual lectures we've been giving to Bahardar, uh, web-based training, uh, and then uh, workshops. And again, like I said, we had to I had to build this thing from the bottom up. We told them, we talked about like you know uh, that there is even lack of awareness. So how do you how do you even address stroke when there was even no word in stroke for stroke in the language, where where people don't have understanding what stroke is? Is this, this they a lot of people even thought stroke is not like a medical condition, but actually it's something you know that hits you you know I don't know devil or some kind of thing. And then we have to create have to create also like the BFAST acronym in Amharic, you know, to tell them, uh, you know, to get to the 
hospital as soon as possible and create that in their own, in, in their own language, in Amharic. And these are all published. And then right now we're working on adaptation of the NIH stroke scale to the local language and culture. Now, because uh, if you remember the NIH stroke scale, you know, I'm sure there are neurologists here. So like the card, you know, uh, that shows uh, the hammock and, you know, and the modern kitchen with, <laughs> with an overflowing sink, you know, as of, you know, African countries, you know, that's, that's just like people are not aware of that. So that's not a very good use. So we have to develop all that, which is important. And then training the stuff of acute stroke care. And then what is it to tell people be fast, run to the hospital, if there is no thrombolytic therapy, which is like a sad situation that has, that I have was very, very passionate about, you know, advocating for uh, like, you know, uh, you know, you know, thrombolytic therapy, TPA, which has been you know, approved for the United States 25, 26 years ago, showed great results, not being available, uh, you know, through for most of, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is like uh, really, really, uh, terrible, terrible thing. So finally, we were able to uh, advocate and get that thrombolytic therapy uh, right now as we speak in the next two days, actually. Uh, it might be delivered for the first time in Bahardar and Addis uh, through, uh, uh, through a World uh, uh, Stroke Organization a pilot program and where we'll be like stroke, start stroke units and, and also you know, train uh, people uh, with, um, you know, by working with the future stroke leaders uh, from all over the world, helping us in a very collaborative way. Uh, so, again, so this is like, I think this picture was taken in maybe 2016 and 2017. So this shows you everything I said, but there is not a like uh, a picture. You know that would you know that would uh, tell a story. So you know this shows you the poor infrastructure. You know I, we talked about this shows poverty. This shows I had to be there. You know to transfer knowledge. I had to fly you know eight thousand miles. You know to do this. Uh, you know and. So this, this is real, real challenge. So uh, a lot of times I have my own way of, uh, you know, non-conventional way of doing things, you know, you know, in academic, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to write a grant, you know, you know, you know, you know put a grant, see what, what brings back. If it didn't go through, you try another one. Well, I'm a little bit impatient. So what I, sometimes what I do is I just pick up the phone and talk to people. So, <laughs> so I've been I've been leading the the telemedicine service at the University of Texas Southwestern, uh, you know, for a number of years, and I've been using like the in touch, uh, 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 you know, app, the in touch app, and I'm just like, geez. I mean, I use this thing, it's, you know, it's a wonderful app. And I've been like a, you know, a passionate user, you know, you know, how come, how come they don't help me if I ask them, but they probably will help me if I want to bring this thing to Bahardar so that, you know, it can make my life easy and I can help lots of people, you know, you know, if they have like this kind of machine over there. So I just pick up the phone and talk to InTouch. And then they said, uh, well, this is like a commercial app, but, 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 you know, the founder of InTouch, Dr. Uh, Elon Wang, has World little Telehealth Initiative. And the executive director, her name is Sharon Allen. If you talk to her, she might have something for you. <laughs> so that's, I called it. This is the first time you know, an, an executive director answered the phone and talked to me. And uh, I mean, the rest is uh, uh, history. And uh, a few months ago, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the machine was delivered. And then a few days ago, we have this picture. 
So you see this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, amazing machine, this bad boy, I say, in there. And at the center uh, is Dr. Uh, Sablowengel. Okay, again, we talked about brain drain. Okay, Dr. Sablowengel is a, now a local neurologist who we spotted in 2017. She was a general practitioner, but she was so smart. We advocated for her. She went to Addis Ababa, trained as a neurologist, you know, graduated top of her class, came back. Now she is leading the stroke and all other neurology stuff for us. So we combat brain drain like that. As we're combating brain drain like us here, like, you know, like us, uh, in, you know, in the, in the West, trying to give back to Africa. Uh, and then you see also like in the screen, at the center of uh, the screen, a Dr. Itzi, who at this time in this, in this picture, this is like the first picture taken uh, after the, uh, since the arrival of the machine, she is connecting from Philadelphia. This is commitment. In Philadelphia time, this was like, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning which was, um, I think uh, it was like, you know, 11 a.m. Ethiopian time. So, so it takes a lot of pieces to work, but where there is a you know, will, where there is passion, there is a way. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to take too much, of, uh, too much of your time. You know, I'm sure you have uh, uh, questions. So uh, I will uh, uh, stop here uh, and, uh, Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahari, for sharing your experience as a stroke neurologist and using telehealth um, in Africa as well as the United States. At this point, I'd like to welcome back all of our speakers for a brief panel discussion. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but certainly questions have come in. So if Dr. Iftikar and, and Dr. Nosa would like to join back on screen, that would be fantastic. Um, so with um, considering the time left, I'm wondering if each of you may have a nugget of advice or guidance that you can share with others in the audience that are seeking to implement maybe a similar innovation in telehealth to improve access to care in their own community. If to occur, perhaps we could start with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I want to thank the two panelists uh, with me, co-panelists, co excellent presentation. Uh, so very quickly, I think that we have uh, discussed about many challenges, but at the same time, we have discussed many opportunities. Challenges like you know remote areas, having difficulties connection because tele device, you know, it needs to be connected sometime mechanical failure, things like that. There was a study a couple of years ago published by Amwell healthcare agencies um, organization say that there is a reluctance among the practitioners to use the telehealth. The patients love it. They, they see the benefit of it when they, they get the interaction, they get the treatment, they get better, they feel it. And that means the patients, they want to get telehealth, telemedicine care. But as doctors ourselves, we are reluctant to use it because we are not used to it. So I think there is a, there is, we need to use um, our resources to create awareness among the physicians and the providers to use telehealth more and more if we want to get, get benefit of this, this uh, technology. Thank you so much. I think that is what I would, I would say that most uh, pressing um, issue that we have. Thank you, Dr. Iftikar. That's an excellent point. Dr. Nosa, do you have a nugget that you can share with our audience as to what they um, might need to know if they were doing a similar project? Uh, yes, just like the previous speaker said, we need to increase awareness on the use of telehealth. In, my, in our community, people are unaware, our doctors are unaware of it, and our, our community members also, they need to know about it. Apart from that, I've discovered in my experience that we are limited by the lack of um, hospital equipment. 
such as laboratory equipment. So when we collaborate with doctors online and co manage, and then we have um, written down investigations, these patients have difficulty assessing, as in carrying out these uh, investigations. So if we can also have along with the telehealth, maybe philanthropic uh, donations of needed equipment, hospital equipment, uh, laboratory equipment that we can use along with these devices, it will go a long way in improving healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Nosa. Lastly, Dr. Mahari, do you have anything you can add? Yeah, I think a couple of things to add is, you know, uh, I think the main thing is to find uh, strong, uh, committed uh, partners. So if you have, if you have uh, very strong, very committed uh, partners, you know, anything is possible and uh, you have to uh, plan for uh, the long haul. Uh, number two is you may need to think of like uh, um, more than one way uh, of uh, telemedicine because uh, sometimes, you know, internet-based uh, connections may not always work. So it could be, it could be more than one, you know, you can have like internet-based and then also like, you know, uh, uh, maybe cloud-based, you know, handheld devices. And you, can, you, should, you should try to, uh, you know, adapt, you know, all of, uh, uh, all of uh, the uh, above. Number three is you have to think of uh, data because, you know, without showing the results in a data, uh, you know, everything else is just like, just like uh, nice talk, nice testimony, nice work. But I think what drives and what uh, brings more growth to this is showing uh, with the data, you know, the results. Absolutely, thank you. Well, there's so many more questions. Um, one of, or several of them are asking about um, policy and regulation and legal requirements. And, and actually I could speak to that. Um, WTI works closely with the World Health Organization. And in fact, um, they're working on a roadmap of telehealth for the underserved. And so always when, certainly when WTI is involved and we come to a country, we um, work with the Ministry of Health to be sure that, that we are complying with any regulations they may have. And also we invite them to have um, eyes on the project and begin to imagine it um, in, in the, the, um, the project they're seeing as well as a greater portion of their country. So always want to be aware of laws and regulations. I think we've actually come to the end of our time, but I know the contact information will be shared. So at this point, I want to thank all of our fabulous presenters, as well as the webinar attendees. And um, it's been an incredibly insightful session today. And I trust that each of you has had the opportunity to learn from the, the speakers and their experiences and take away new ideas about how to harness the power of telehealth in your own health system. And if you would like to learn more about how telehealth is improving access to care, links to each of the organizations involved in today's webinar can be found on the screen. Thank you so much.